Clarence Cooper, um, I've heard uh, military veterans say that, um, you know, most people who are paying attention observe history happening, uh, but if you serve in the military, you're, you're more likely to actually participate in the history that's happening. I, I think that's certainly the case with you. You have uh, direct experience with uh, two of the big events of that era from the late 60s to the late 70s. You're a Vietnam veteran, and we won't focus on that. We, we, I hope we will have another conversation about your time in Vietnam, a separate conversation about that. But you were not only a Vietnam veteran, but you were there during that critical turning point of the Tet Offensive. And uh, we can talk, and not only the Tet Offensive, but uh, you know, you played a role in one of the most remembered battles of the Tet Offensive, uh, the Battle for Way. And we'll, uh, in, a, in a later conversation, we'll discuss that. We fast forward a mere 10 years from the Tet Offensive, uh, a, a bit over 10 years, we fast forward to 1978, the latter part of 1978, and now we have the tragedy that unfolds in Guyana at Jonestown, where more than 900 people participate in the um, the biggest mass suicide of, of modern times. And you played a role in the immediate aftermath of that. So to get us to get us started, what what was your job? And when we get to the fall of 1978. What was your job at that time with the U.S. Army? I was stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. I was commanding uh, the 498 Air Ambulance Company. Uh, we had the mission of providing air ambulance support to uh, the Fort Benning uh, and the two ranger camps that, uh, that they were operating, one in North uh, Georgia and one down at Eglin Air Force Base. Um, we had uh, uh, 25 helicopters assigned to my company. One platoon was located at uh, Fort Stewart, uh, Georgia, and the other one at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Six aircraft at each of those locations and the others uh, at Fort Benning. Yeah, and so when you're doing training missions, what, what sort of missions did you train for? Uh, well, our primary mission is patient evacuation. Uh, we also have the mission of transporting med medical personnel, medical supplies. Uh, uh, we train for all kinds of ter terrain and weather. Um, our helicopters had uh, rescue hoists in them. Uh, that's the, one of the main reasons that uh, we were contacted for Jonestown, Guyana, surrounded by a uh, triple canopy jungle. We had the capability of extracting patients from the jungle using our rescue hoists. Because you're, you, uh, you mentioned in something you wrote that Initially, you thought your, your mission was going to be primarily or substantially about rescuing people from the jungle. We were told initially they thought that only about half the, the uh, uh, Jonestown residents had committed suicide, and they thought that hundreds had fled into the jungle. Wow. Initially... Our mission was to do search and rescue uh, for those who were around June, Jonestown. Uh, of course, as time went on, they realized uh, that uh, all of the residents had committed suicide. So, Yeah, I think with maybe the exception of five, something like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so we'll, 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 come, we'll come, come back to that and, and just sort of walk through it um, step by step. So your, your original idea is you're going to go down and, and, and do search and rescue. And, and, and that actually makes a lot of sense. I've watched news reports that are even three or four days after the event, and the body count is still in the 500 range. Um, it, because folks didn't realize 
you know, as horrible as it is, there are bodies under bodies. And so it takes all this time to... What, had you ever heard of Jonestown before, you know, the event itself? Had, had that ever registered? Never, never. You'd never heard of it? No, so I saw it in the news, probably the same as you and everyone else. Uh, so the uh, footage of Congressman Ryan and his entourage being attacked on the, uh, the airstrip there at Kaituma. Yeah. And then uh, the next day they discovered the results of the mass suicide at Jonestown. Yeah. Uh, but before that, I would never heard of the People's Temple or, uh, or Jonestown. Yeah. So, you know, I was in, I think, junior high school at the time. So, you know, I really didn't have any idea what was going on. But you, so you're, I mean, this might be an example of what we're talking about. When you're in the military, you know, you're not just observing histories that happened, but you're actually participating. Because if I understand correctly, you're watching the news of what happened with Congressman Ryan. And the next day, you get the call that you're going. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, the next morning, I was called to our battalion headquarters and said, uh, my unit is being alerted to deploy to Jonestown. Wow. So that was kind of uh, kind of exciting news. Well, yeah, I mean, is is you know, is there that sense of? Um, I mean, was there that sense of, wow? I mean, you know, I'm I'm actually participating in something that's in the news, you know. Uh, yes, and there was a lot of confusion about uh, exactly what had happened down there. Uh, yeah. What exactly our mission would be. Uh, when we deployed, we were issued live ammunition. They thought, well, they knew that, uh, that there were armed, armed guards in Jonestown. And as I say, it was unknown if uh, just how many had committed suicide or if there were still armed guards down there, if we would encounter. Wow. Uh, Fire. We were prepared for that. Uh, as it turns out, we did not need it, of course. Right. So you were actually part of the part of the planning, which I imagine is coming together very quickly. Part of the planning is possibly even small-scale combat of some kind. Uh, we were prepared for for that if uh, if it ha had happened. Yeah. How long? How much time was there between getting the order? and actually then being on the ground at, in Guyana? At first, when we found out on the, it was on the morning of November 20th uh, that we were alerted, they wanted us to be prepared to deploy that evening. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and there was confusion about whether we would deploy on C-141 aircraft or C-5 aircraft aircraft. Uh, there's a significant difference because if we had gotten C-5s, the large transport, a UH-1 uh, helicopter can go intact into that. If it was 141s, we had to disassemble a helicopter, take off the rotor blades, take off the mast, horizontal exactly. stabilizer, uh, which is a big job. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out we did have to go on 141s. Uh, we deployed with four Huey helicopters, UH-1s. Yeah. Uh, took a lot of work. We worked all that night, the night of the 20th. And uh, we deployed the night of the 21st, the next, uh, the next evening. Yeah, I'm looking at one of your photos here. And a helicopter being put into the back of a plane, and as I look at it now, it doesn't have the doesn't have the rotors on it. So it had to be disassembled, really, parts of it. Yeah, that's a big job. It would take uh, six to eight hours disassembling and uh, and then to reassemble each helicopter. Wow. Now, when you when you arrived in Guyana, did you go first into Georgetown into the capital? Yes, that's where we flew into. 
Oh. That's the, I think that's the only airport in all of Guyana that could take a C-141. I see. And so the helos are then reassembled there? Yes. Um, yeah, we arrived there uh, the night of the 21st. The uh, 22nd, uh, all day, we were getting the helicopters reassembled. One problem we had is uh, some torrential rainstorms. Mm. Uh, we were working, we didn't have a hangar, and we worked outside. Uh, and uh, weather made it very difficult. But by that night of the 22nd, uh, working into the night, we got all four helicopters ready, ready to fly. We wow. started flying missions the morning of the 23rd. So, I mean, by this point now, we're four days, you know, we're, we're, the event takes place on the 18th, and so we're, we're four days on. Is the, do you know, had American forces preceded you already when you arrived? Were there already American forces in Jonestown? Yes. An infantry unit from Panama was down at Jonestown. Uh, those guys had the toughest job. They had, had the job of loading the bodies into body bags. Uh, and then most of those bodies were flown back on Air Force uh, CH-53 helicopters, the Jolly Green Giants. Oh, okay. They could carry a lot of bodies. So th those bodies were carried back to Georgetown and then from Georgetown. Oh, they were uh, put on helos, taken to Georgetown, and then from Georgetown back to the States? Yes. By C-141, they were flown from uh, Georgetown to Dover, Dover Air Force Base, where the military mortuary is located. Yeah. Um, what... Um, so, so you're in Georgetown, and now you're on the Helos, and you're making your way to Jonestown. What are the, what are the first, first things you remember about Jonestown? Well, first we had a challenge. Uh, we did not have good maps. Uh, hmm. Jonestown is about 120 uh, nautical miles from, from Georgetown. Uh, navigation was very difficult because there's just jungle without any landmarks. Uh, wow. They did what's called pilotage. You fly, they, they told us the heading to fly, and we knew the distance, but uh, we were able to, uh, to find Jonestown. Uh, wow. There was a little fear of the unknown as we're flying, as we're flying and flying out there. Uh, you probably saw in the photos there a picture of another helicopter. Mm. We always flow, flew with uh, two or more helicopters. If a single helicopter were to have an engine failure over that jungle, there's no way it would ever be found. Wow. Uh, so yeah. if, if someone got in trouble, we wanted to have another aircraft there that could, uh, could assist. I see, yeah, yeah. So when you, you so you do find Jonestown, are you able to find it pretty easily? Yes, we did. Uh, okay. uh, as I say, our, as long as we flew the correct heading for the right distance, we found it. And as we got farther to the west, the terrain became a little bit hilly, uh, so you could make out some land land features better. Um, for most of the for the first hundred miles, flat uh, jungle, without any any landmarks to, to help us navigate. Yeah, and what 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 are your first memories, either from the air or on the ground? Just you know, your first the first things you remember when you know you actually come into contact with Jonestown, either visually or you're on the ground. What are the some of the first things you you remember? What I remember is uh, we, it stood out because of the large clearing in the, in the jungle. Uh, the people's temple, those, those people had worked so hard clearing that jungle. Mm. Uh, 
uh, had taken a lot of work uh, and they had planted crops. They were obviously were very industrious. Mm. Then we circled the buildings and you could make out the large central building, you know, where the, where the meetings were held, all the colors around it. You could probably see that on the, on the photos. Yeah. And as we got closer, we realized those were bodies. Wow. So you, I mean, there are these powerful images and, and you've got photos of it where you're in the air and the pavilion, of course, is sort of the central yeah. site there in Jonestown. And you see a lot of different colors around it, but at first you didn't realize that those that those were bodies. That was the closure. First, no, until we got until we got got closer. But then, even flying five hundred feet above Jonestown, the smell mm. smell mm. of those bodies and the tropical heat. They'd been decomposing for for four days when when we got there, and. Uh, Wow. What, what, what impact, you know, it's a long time ago, but, and you, you know what you're heading into at this point. I mean, by this point, I'm sure you've heard reports and, and you kind of know what's coming, but um, I imagine though it's not really real until you actually see it. And then as you say, there's the smell as well. Um, how did, how did that change your, your sense of things. I'm, I'm just. I guess I'm just wondering how that changed. What impact that had on you, or or were you just very job focused? And I mean, I'm just interested in in how that changes things for you, if at all. Once you actually see, wow, those those colors are actually bodies, and and we can smell it from here. You know, I had been in Vietnam. I'd seen a lot of death, uh, a lot of car human carnage. But uh, when we landed at, uh, at Jonestown, I reported to the, to the commander there, and uh, I walked among the dead. I walked up to the, to the pavilion. Wow. And uh, uh, I had never seen death on that scale. I'd seen a lot of bodies in, in Vietnam, but nothing like that. Uh, what bothered me the most, though, was seeing the children and babies. Mm. Uh, they did not commit suicide. Right. Uh, I walked up to the vat of Kool-Aid. Oh, my gosh. Uh, with the cyanide in it. Wow. Uh, a lot of syringes around there. The syringes had been used to squirt it down the throats of the, of the babies and children. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you, 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 it must be... Uh, well, I guess I'm, I don't know. I have no idea what my reaction would be, but uh, I mean, you must be almost speechless, really, when you're seeing this. Stuff. I was. I, I was. It's uh, uh, as I say. I thought I was. I was had developed a callousness, you know, to to to, to death, having seen a lot in Vietnam. But uh, the impact uh, of that, the enormity of the of the disaster. Uh, it took a while to, to sink in. Wow. Um, well, the, the, other, the other photos that I thought uh, yeah. uh, that uh, from Colonel Van Stratton, uh, someone else had walked among there and taken those. Uh, the other yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, you, you referred a minute ago to the bat. And so, so far as you know, there was just one. That's all I saw was one, and I believe that uh, I don't believe there was another one. I believe there was just one that the people lined up at. I, there may have been more. I mean, this is for me. This is, I mean, the whole the whole thing is heartbreaking. But one of the things that I really focus on is you've got more than nine hundred people, but just one vat, and it would only take one person to kick that vat over, at least to slow things down. Um. It may seem like a dumb question, but you know, when I think about that, you know, over 900 people, and it only take one to kick that bat over. Um, so it may seem like a dumb question, but I, could you just tell me a little about the bat? I mean, how, how big was it? Um, was there was there still liquid in it? Yes, it was. Uh, 
You know what a 55 gallon drum is? Yeah. And one of those had been cut, I believe. It looked like half of a 55 gallon gallon drum. Um, but I believe the people lined up, and of course, uh, you know, Jones had had such powerful control over his people. Uh, because I wondered that how how people could do that, seeing what uh, what was happening to those ahead of them in the line. I think the sign I took effect very very quickly. Yeah. But I think Jones had them line up, take their drink, go lay down, lay down in rows, you know, and uh, with their arms around each other, as you see in the photos. And yes. Yeah, and how much time that must have taken. I mean, one bat, more than 900 people, that's going to take some time. Um, and I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but there is actually, you know, there's recording. Uh, you can sort of hear this catastrophe unfolding. Yep, you can hear Jer Jones, Jones in the, in, the, in the background, yeah. Yeah. Did, now, I, I, I'm guessing the answer is no, but you, you didn't see the body of Jim Jones himself? I did not, but he, his body was evacuated by one of my helicopters. Really? Yes. Wow. Did you, so there were only five survivors. Um, I'm guessing you didn't have any interaction with any, any of them. No. no. How about interaction with the Guyanese? I mean, did the Guyanese basically just hand this operation over to the Americans, or were they also involved? Uh, I don't believe they were involved. I think it was just it was just Americans. And just American. I had no interaction with any any Guyanese while while I was there. Um, do you remember the? I mean, I imagine you there are probably a couple other Vietnam vets around. Um, I know that one of the survivors, actually, one of the five survivors, actually himself was a Vietnam vet. I so I think joined the People's Temple looking for peace. Um, but I mean, you, I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, you're doing this and you're doing your work. And, you know, we can talk about what your work actually involved. But did you just work in, in silence or, I mean, just what sorts of things do you talk about in that kind of context, if any? Um. I think everyone, I think all of my flight crew members were Vietnam veterans. Really? I think, wow. I think we had all, had all been to Vietnam. You know, we had all seen a lot of, a lot of human carnage. But uh, we, were, we were all in shock to see death on that, on that scale. Mm -hmm. The people that uh, I really felt sorry for were those infantry soldiers that were out had the job of putting the bodies into into body bags, mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that many of them had uh, PTSD from from that that experience. I probably talking about about a lot of E two, Z three, Z fours, huh? Doing this work. Yeah. I mean, junior enlisted guys. Yes. Yeah. When when you arrived on the ground at Jonestown, then what was what was the nature of your particular work then? You know, how did you, how did you spend the day? Uh, well, as I say, our mission changed. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we first got there, uh, they thought they're still, uh, what they, uh, the initial, or actually this was before we left. They thought we would uh, have loudspeakers in our helicopters and would fly around the jungle, around Jonestown, uh, telling the people we were there to help them to come out of the jungle into the clearing, that, uh, that we, that we would, would rescue them. But I think by the time we got there, they realized there were no, there were no survivors. So instead of... Uh, Instead of we did uh, did no search and rescue at all, uh, because as you pointed out, they realized the bodies were stacked three and four high, and in fact there were 913 uh, fatalities. Uh, so our mission 
We had four helicopters. We transported uh, key personnel back and forth, uh, supplies, and then we carried bodies out. Um, we, they did not allow us to stack any bodies. We would carry bodies in our litters. Uh, uh, the Huey can take three litter patients and four ambulatory patients. Of course, there were no ambulatories. So we would carry three bodies at a time uh, and flew them from Jonestown to Georgetown. Three at a time and how many helos? Four. Oh, boy. So but this is, this is going to take a while. It would have. We did not carry that many bodies because it was so inefficient. Most of them went by the Jolly Green Giants. Oh, I, I see. How many the Air Force had down there, but they had quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. How, and now, how, how long were you on the ground there in, in, in Jonestown, Guiana, as part of this operation? Or uh, Georgetown, Jonestown, just in this, how long did this operation take for you? Three days. We flew the uh, 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th. By the afternoon of November 25th, all of the bodies had been removed. And so you're home on the 26th? Yes. I'm wondering about, um, you know, something I've talked to combat veterans about a lot is, um, especially Vietnam guys, you know, I just talked to one last week. He's up on the DMZ seeing combat, and literally a week later, he's back in Arkansas. Um, you know, just looking for a job in Arkansas. And kind of that, you know, that, that re-entry. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if coming back from the Jonestown situation, if, if that re-entry back into life in Georgia, if that was as strange as was the re-entry from a combat zone in Vietnam coming back to the States. Do you know what I'm saying? Just the, the awkwardness of that re-entry. Like, was I really in Jonestown three days ago? That, that sort of thing. How did that go? Yes, it's, uh, it's very, very similar. Uh, the, the impact of, uh, of being there, of seeing and smelling, uh, the, the, what sticks with you is, is the smell. Uh, a human body has a distinctive, distinctive smell. And Jonestown, you know, 900 bodies, four to, to six days old in that tropical heat. Uh, they gave us surgical masks with wintergreen oil on the, on the inside, but that didn't, that did not totally stopped. There's no way you could stop that, wow. that terrible smell. As yeah. I say, the guys that I think would have the, the most difficulty uh, recovering from that experience, those infantry soldiers loading bodies into, into body bags, yeah. some of them for probably four, four days in a row, the tropical heat and humidity. Uh, but the psychological impacts, I'm sure many of many of those young young soldiers had real difficulty recovering from, from what they, they had seen. Uh, it, but my it, guys, uh, some of them, uh, I I think had had trouble uh, when they when they, when they uh, got got back. Yeah. Some of them probably required some some counseling. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. In your case, did you at least need a day or two just to kind of decompress? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, it uh, is hard. It's hard to hard to believe what what we had seen. Yeah. Now I'm I'm looking at other photos that you sent. It looks like one of the photos there are rows of small cottages. Um, and That's in that, Jonestown. What's that? That is in Jonestown. Yeah. And then another photo. You've got buildings sort of spread out. Um, you, you you mentioned that the people of Jonestown were obviously very industrious. Um, what other impressions did you have? Obviously, you're not able to talk to anybody who lived there. 
Um, but just from what you saw of how the place was set up, what was your, I guess, so I guess it's more like an archaeologist, you know, a question to an archaeologist. You can't talk to people who actually live there, but you can get a sense of what the life was like just from their buildings and, and how they set things up. What was your sense of, of Jonestown? You know, obviously, it's, as I say, aside from the horrible thing, which I realize you can't really separate it. But if you, you know, just think about the buildings and how the place was laid out, what was your sense of, of the place? I walked through many of the buildings, those larger buildings. Uh, it was like a military barracks, stacked bunks, four high, uh, very little furniture uh, in them. I think it was very austere uh, for, the, for the people that, that were there. Yeah. Uh, I did some reading about Jonestown after that and saw some other features on it. And I think Jones, uh, Jim Jones picked that location because it was so isolated. There was no radio and TV uh, around there. He had total control over his people. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was... Uh, it became obvious to Congressman Ryan and some others that there was a lot of discontent in in Jonestown. Yeah, many people realize it was not the uh, the tropical paradise that uh, Jones had, the socialist paradise that Jones had uh, had promised yeah. his, his people. Yeah. yeah, and they had to work very very hard. I think it was more of a labor camp than a than a paradise. Mm. So, I mean, I admire the uh, the amount of work they accomplished clearing that jungle, planting yeah. crops. Yeah. Uh, in very adverse weather and climate conditions. So hot, very much like Vietnam, so hot and humid. Yeah. Uh, wow. Life was very, very difficult there. Do you, do you remember seeing, you know, the, the loudspeakers? Yes. You, yep. saw, you saw that, and so then there's that little walkway. I, I guess the walkway goes into the pavilion? Yes. Where the bat was. You saw the yep. loudspeakers? Yep. There's the, the, the sign that's been photographed, those who don't know his, the past are deemed, doomed to repeat. Did you see that sign? I did see the sign, yes. It must, you know, just speaking to you personally now, I mean, you know, you participated in two events about which a lot of books have been written, you know. Uh, just a couple of years ago, a new thick book on the Battle of Way came out. Of course, memoirs of Vietnam are constantly being written. Uh, biography of Jim Jones, I think a new one just came out a, a couple of years ago. Um, um, so I, I guess I'm, the, the question I'm asking, this is just sort of a personal question to you. I mean, how does that strike you when you realize that you personally participated in, I mean, two of the, the biggest events of American history, you know, post-World War II, Vietnam, but especially the Tet Offensive, then with Intent, the Battle of the Way, and then the, the Jonestown thing. I mean, has that occurred to you that this is, this is pretty extraordinary that you, just as an individual, participated in these two Huge events. Yes, uh, uh, it gives me a greater appreciation for life, for my life. Uh, there was so much carnage in both of those, in a way, so much, so much death. You know, the North Vietnamese went into way. You know, uh, 20 battalions, yeah, they say 8,000 uh, 8, or so North Vietnamese soldiers are the biggest, the biggest enemy force that we faced in the whole Vietnam War. And, of course, they, uh, they killed many people in, uh, in way. Uh, many of them were killed, of course, many North Vietnamese, South yeah. Vietnamese, American military. Yeah. It, uh, uh, so much waste of, of life. And then at Jonestown, 
so much needless waste of life. And, mm. and yeah, the thought has occurred to me as to you, what could motivate 900 people to line up and drink, drink the, the Kool-Aid? And I'd read where Jones had rehearsed this. He would have the white knights. Mm -hmm. The people would line up thinking they were going to be committing suicide, drink the Kool-Aid. And he'd say, oh, this was just a rehearsal. I'm testing, I'm testing uh, your loyalty to me. Wow. And, uh, well, they, they obviously uh, did the real thing just as they had, had been taught to. Yeah. Think of how one person could control, have such mind control over his, his people. He obviously was a very charismatic leader. Uh, but what a, what a tragic waste of life. I, I, I hear that. I hear that. Let me just ask about, um, there are two photos I'm looking at here as we begin to, to wrap up. One is of an airstrip. And there's a, there's a, looks like there are two planes on it, actually, now they look at it. There are two planes in this small, on this airstrip. It looks like the airstrip is, is dirt. Is that the airstrip where uh, Congressman Ryan was? Do, do you know it is. That is, that is the uh, Kaituma Airport, and that larger airplane is the one that was shot up. That's the one that uh, Congressman Ryan and his entourage were going to get on and fly back to. To Georgetown. I see. So it's the one basically facing the going lengthwise with the with the um, airstrip. That's that's the that's the plane. Yes. And so there's this other photo here. I'm looking at it now. It looks like yeah. It looks like it's the same plane, although it's from behind. That's actually the plane where Congressman Ryan. It is. It was. So you saw the you. I'm imagining there were bullet holes in the plane itself. Yes. Yeah, they couldn't move it. It was, it was pretty well shot up. I don't know what happened to it, no. Wow. I mean, it's, you know, from the perspective of a history teacher, it's, it's extraordinary to talk to somebody who was there, you know, because I show my students documentaries and you read the books, but it seems like an abstraction. And if you watch the documentaries, it almost seems like, you read the books and you know you you know that that what happened was was real but it's still kind of an abstraction but to talk to somebody who actually saw the plane where congressman ryan and others were were shot and killed you you, you you've seen the loudspeakers you saw the bat i think that's probably the most poignant thing well i mean apart from the bodies themselves you, you saw all of this it's um it's really been uh it's really been a privilege to, to talk with you and to, and to hear your memories. I guess I have I guess I have one one last question, and this is a real general one. Let's uh, let's put you in front of a group of say twenty, you know, university students, and based on your experience in Vietnam, in Jonestown, or at Jonestown, and then just other things you've picked up in life. But I guess thinking about these, these two really intense experiences. Um, what do you think is an important thing for young people to know just about life itself? I realize this is a very broad question, but here's your chance just to say something to these young people about something you've learned that you've drawn from these very intense experiences. Well, that's a tough one. Uh... Uh, value every day we have on this earth. Uh, I'm fortunate to still be alive. I had many close calls in Vietnam. I lost many, many friends. Uh, but I've witnessed uh, how cruel one people can be to each other. Uh, always have hope for the, for the future. Um, uh, as far as Jonestown, that one is, uh, that one is very, very difficult. Uh, uh, seeing, seeing what one man, one man's evil can, uh, the, the, the destruction and death that, uh, that 
that uh, one man can can cause. It, uh, it's so depressing. Uh, I would say value life and do everything you can to make uh, life better for uh, for yourself and your family and in society. And for other people, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Cooper, I really appreciate the time you you spent to, to talk with us. I appreciate that you made your photos from Jonestown available, and and uh, these photos will be available to others on this video, but also um, they've been made available to the Jonestown Institute, housed there at San Diego State University as well. So your photos have become, are in the process of becoming uh, part of the historical record, uh, which will be useful for teaching other people, as will this conversation that you and I have. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to a future conversation about your time, focusing on your time in, in Vietnam. I, I really appreciate the time you spent. Thank you. Well, thank you for documenting uh, the, the, the tragic events of Jonestown so that others can learn from that. Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate it.